What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of the sit down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit that like button and let me know what you think of today's very interesting discussion in the comment section below. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. Also, if you want more great crime content, Please check out the sit down on TikTok right now. We cover past and present crime also from a historical perspective. Make sure you check it out for great crime content today. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get into another very interesting organized crime topic. And the topic is twofold generally here when I'm asked questions about today's mafia. Who's still involved and what does the mafia do today? How do they make money? Well, today we're going to delve into it. The story of today's mafia rackets and how they make money next on the sit down. Now, I'm going to go over four very high end ways the mob makes money. And yeah, they've changed and adapt a little bit, but the mob pedigree is still there as far as bread and butter extortion. And no, they're not going into Starbucks and extorting them, but they can still extort people. We'll tell you how. We'll get into labor racketeering. We'll get into some of the other things with proof that the mob is still involved with them today. The first thing I want to talk about is labor racketeering, something that the mafia is still very involved in. In fact, when you look up the FBI definition of labor racketeering, they would call it the domination, manipulation, and control of a labor movement that affects related businesses and industry. Now, when we look into how the mafia does things in labor rackets is they go into a union hall, let's say the ILA or the Teamsters, and they use their power and ability to overtake it uh, by manipulating people and essentially infiltrating it. Now, what that will lead to is access of employee benefit funds, pension funds, uh, different medical plans. Um, and what it will also do is they can control jobs. They can control job sites. They control employees, no-show jobs. We've heard that word. What does that mean? What do those words mean? It means essentially they can create phony jobs and give paychecks to people that don't actually work. And what this ultimately leads to is once they infiltrate a union hall, they put their people. We've heard those wiretaps from Tony Ducks. We're going to staff it with our people, secretaries, organizers, secretaries, anybody, union secretaries, anybody that's involved is mob controlled. And what they'll do is they'll go to the current people that are union people and they'll say, okay, we're taking everything you have. We're taking all the pension funds. We're taking the employee benefits. We're extorting workers through Christmas time bonuses or lunch wagons. We're also going to extort you. So you're getting paid 60 G's. You pay us a thousand a week now too. So that's how they're extorting people now. And we've seen in recent indictments, one of which involving the Gambino crime family and these individuals, you can hear directly in the indictment, people using violent extortion methods to, um, you know, take money from people. You look at a recent bust over the last several years involving the Colombo and Bonanno crime families, including this guy, a person called Vincent Vinny Unions Ricciardo. We would know Vinny Unions recently passed away. He was involved with extorting a Queens Union local. One of the things we saw in that case, not only extortion, not only labor racketeering, but they're doing things like selling fake phony OSHA certification. So they're allowing people both legally and illegally to work on job sites and say that they're union OSHA certified when they're not. So they're taking $500 from each person and putting people that are not cleared to work on sites on sites. And what that leads to is people not doing jobs correctly, people being hurt from not doing jobs correctly. It's incredibly damaging and destructive. And this all comes from having labor racketeering control. Now, are they looting the Teamsters pension fund, which, which is worth hundreds of millions of dollars today? No. But having control of unions and people under your control that are high up in unions is still important and still going on. 
Let's take a look at one of the biggest unions in the country, something called the ILA, the International Longshoremen's Association. The Genovese crime family has had control of various unions in and around New Jersey and New York for 70, 80 years. Now, I want to talk about a particular local, one that is still around today, local 1804-1 out of New Jersey, North Bergen. One of the original leaders of that union was this guy, a person called Harold Daggett. Now, when you look into the ILA today, Harold Daggett is the current national president. He is in control of almost 90,000 longshoremen across America. And actually, recently, you may have seen him on CNN or MSNBC or Fox News due to the fact that he is whining, complaining about wanting pay raises and that the ILA is going to strike and we're going to have major problems, which he's not wrong on. That said, for decades, Harold Daggett is an associate of the Genovese crime family. We would know that through various connections he has had with multiple union leaders. In fact, in the mid-2000s, Mr. Daggett was indicted by the federal government for being involved with the mafia. Let's talk about some of his behavior over the years. Now, one of the first people that Mr. Daggett was extorted by was longtime Genovese waterfront kingpin George Barone. Now, in the 80s, George Barone would flip. However, even before flipping it in retirement, it was said that Barone held considerable influence on the waterfront and said he was delegated to tell a person called John Bowers, who was a union head, that the Genovese family wanted to see Harold Daggett become president of the ILA. And he would say at one point that Harold is, quote, with me and I'm with the family. That means we're in control because we have our man as president. So the goal was back in the 80s, George Barone saw hopefully down the road their man mob influenced Harold Daggett out of local 1804-1 would be national president and how happy they would be today that he is that. We'd also hear more about Mr. Daggett. A federal indictment in a pending case says that Daggett and two other individuals were all Genovese crime family associates who, quote, did what they were told, including securing jobs for scores of organized crime relatives at the New Jersey Piers, which we have found out is still going on today. And I'll talk about Daggett's connections to today's mobsters. Now, the indictment would also say that Daggett at Barone's behest steered the union's prescription drug contract to a company controlled by the Genovese family. So what I'm doing here is this is, again, back in the 80s and 90s, but I'm selling the seeds of who Daggett is. Now, the company, according to the indictment, was a company located in Newark. And in prior testimony, George Brown would testify he sent word to Daggett to support the company that the mob controlled as far as prescription drugs were concerned. Now, asked if Daggett had any choice in the matter, Barone said, no, why not? Because I told him to do it. I put him there. I would have taken him out of there if we ha he hadn't done what he was supposed to do with a request from me. Now, Daggett down the road would complain that he was just being extorted by Barone and that he testified, Barone, that he put a loaded gun to Daggett's head and threatened to kill him, stating, quote, I will blow your fucking brains all over the room. Now, Daggett would then cry on the witness stand as he recalled the incident and told the jury that he was so terrified that he wet his pants as Barone shouted, quote, this is my fucking local. I'll kill you, your wife, and your children if you take my local from me. Now, it wasn't all crying and weeping for Harold Daggett. If we look into today, we can find over the last 10 years various reports that the Genovese crime family is still got people, family members, making money on the docks. In fact, Daggett at one point would state, quote, about a member of the Genovese crime family, Chin Giganti's son, Andrew Giganti, quote, he's the most popular guy on the piers, and he's my best friend. We also know that Harold Daggett received um, lauding for getting a job for the current high up in the family, Patty Falchetti's son, who eventually lost his job due to the fact that his father is a Genovese crime family member. So Daggett has relationships with Andrew Giganti, Patsy Falchetti, and various other members of the family still in control today. Um, and this is what happens. What did we just hear them say? 
we are going to find people and we're going to staff these places with our people. And Harold Daggett is now the national president. You better believe there's all sorts and scores of mobsters still making money on the docks in 2023. It's always going to be rife with corruption and they're never going to totally be uh, ridded off docks and out of other unions. Another thing that the mafia makes a lot of money in today is in construction. And a lot of some of the things that I'm going to talk about in this part of this, uh, we've talked about before. I've talked recently about a case involving a person called Robert Basalich, who is, as far as we know, a reputed member of the Gambino crime family under Staten Island captain Frank, Frank Calypso Camuso. Now, Basilich is the former vice president of a construction company called the Rinaldi Group, which is a Sea Caucus, New Jersey based contractor that received $4.2 million in payments from building contractors who received $100 million in contracts and change orders. He awarded them in return for illegal kickbacks that were funneled to the Staten Island company that he controlled. Now, in one case, a Genovese member called Chris Chiariccio and his plumbing company, RCI PLBG Inc., are charged with receiving $13 million in subcontracts from Rinaldi Group and teaming up with Boss Leach to steal approximately $300,000 from a director. At Boss Leach's direction, the wise guy allegedly funneled nearly $200,000 in kickbacks to companies owned by other co defendants, including Frank. Camuso. So again, this is just one person doing this. There are various people in various parts of these families that are doing stuff through construction, major construction developments, uh, commercial businesses, high-rise buildings. A lot of construction today is still overseen by various people in the mafia. We've talked about Andrew Campos, who is a high-ranking member in the Gambino family today, he recently got out and did 37 months in federal prison due to his involvement in the construction industry. We look at another guy, a guy you've probably never heard of. You've probably seen this photo, though, right? Look at this photo right here. Who do we see in this photo? We see Anthony Fat Tony Salerno sitting in front of the Palma Boys Social Club. This is back in the early 80s. There is an individual seen with the initials LW above his head. Look who he's in front of. Tony Salerno, one of the most powerful people in the history of the mafia. That is Lawrence Wecker. Lawrence Wecker is still around today. And guess what? He is still a mob associate. He is still involved in construction scams and kicking up millions of dollars to not only the Genovese crime family, but the Lucchese crime family. Let's understand what Mr. Wecker is involved in. This is quite interesting. Now, Wecker, over the last several years, is the central figure, according to the indictment, among eight defendants and six companies charged with stealing millions of dollars from city and state agencies in New York by fraudulently obtaining subsidies for numerous building contracts in a scam that began nearly 10 years ago and continued to 2023. The scheme including falsely claiming that workers on Wecker's building projects were employed by woman-owned or minority-owned drywall companies, as well as involving himself in bribery and insurance fraud. So what he did was he instituted fake companies with women and black women in control of them, and he paid them bribes to do this stuff so they could get subsidies from the government that allowed him to pocket millions of dollars. Similar, if you look into The Sopranos, similar to the scheme that Tony and um, various people do with that black guy in, I think, season four in Newark in the housing world, they were using the black guy as the front to get subsidies from the government and steal a bunch of money. Now, notice this photo. This is Larry Wecker giving a bribe to a woman called LaShawn Henry in front of a construction company in East Harlem. Now, when we read into this, in order to qualify for contracts that required the inclusion of minority or women-owned businesses, Wecker would create fake companies operated by Henry or a woman called Lisa Rossi, who was also charged. At one point, Miss Rossi was reported complaining to Wecker, stating, quote, stop telling people I'm an owner. I'm just a pass-through. Now, at one point, 
we see this photograph of him paying a bribe to LaShawn Henry, who is used to get the minority owned business work for Wecker's company, a company called JM3. At one point in 2021, Wecker was overheard discussing this arrangement showed with Henry with a foreman for JM3. Wecker would state, we have a good thing in there with this woman, LaShawn. I take care of her. We use her, a black. She is a black woman's business thing. She works for them as a community organizer. She's always pushing us. They have a 400-unit job on Atlantic Avenue, and it's supposedly our job. And we don't want to blow it. So there you go. Wecker, who in the 2000s was indicted alongside Stephen Crea and yet again another construction scam, is still up to it. Lawrence Wecker is in his 80s and was recently released from federal prison. Wecker, again, he's been around since the 70s. He's been a Genovese and Lucchese associate kicking up to the mob for years. Again, as well, in construction, we look at this recent Gambino indictment from last year involving uh, Joseph Lanny and people like that. We look at what this indictment says. It's extortion. Again, not just going into a store and asking for 50 or $100. The mob now uses extortion in construction. In the indictment, there's extortion related to the carding and demolition industry. Now, the scheme involves threatening a person called John Doe One with a bat, setting fire to the steps of his home, and attempting to damage his garbage trucks and violently assaulting an associate of his. Now, one of the individuals in the case was captured on authorized wiretaps discussing the threats they made to him, John Doe One, and his father in law. One defendant, Vito Rappa, would state, that someone acted like, quote, the last of the samurai, describing how a defendant, Vicari, picked up a knife and threatens John Doe. They also talk about extortion scams involving carding um, and assaulting an owner on a street corner in Manhattan, hammer assaults with a demolition dispatcher. So again, it's not just building construction. These guys are involved in demolition, violently taking over. And what they're doing now, which is totally scummy, People will pay the extortion fee and they'll still assault them. So then taking the money is not enough. We're going to then hurt you anyway, just because we can. This is what these guys are doing now. Construction is still rife in New York City with the mafia, still very much. You look into the Bonanno crime thing, Michael Mancusa, there was involvement of him in uh, construction scams. All these construction scams are very prevalent and still very much going on. The One of the bread and butter industries of the mafia is still gambling and you wouldn't believe it, but sports betting is still very much run in the back seats of social clubs, delis, and bars. Yes, New York has legalized sports betting. That said, there's a major difference between legalized and illegal sports betting. When you bet with a legal bookmaker, if you go to a FanDuel sportsbook or a DraftKings sportsbook, you want to bet $200 on a game, you've got to put that $200 up. The mafia says, we don't need you to put any money up. We'll give you credit, and you can bet until you relinquish that credit, or we set up a weekly, monthly, or biweekly way of paying. So they give you an account. You can bet all you want, and if you lose $5,000, you better pay us. So you can work on credit, which is way different than a legal sports book. Now, generally, everybody gets paid and nobody's upset. But the mafia still in various neighborhoods has the ability to make a lot of money doing this. Over the last year or two, there was an indictment involving the Genovese and Bonanno crime families. On the left, Bonanno captain, little Anthony Pipitone. On the right, Genovese captain, Carmelo Carmine Pizza Polito. Both of these people are currently in federal prison for their involvement in various gambling rackets run out of social clubs in Queens, in Long Island, all over the place. And they're making 10, 20, 30,000 a week in various different clubs around the city. And where are they being run out of? Cafes, social clubs, shoe shine businesses, little businesses that you would never assume. You can look up through the test of time over the last 10 years, bars owned by mobsters where they're acting as fronts. We look at gambling machines. They're still very much uh, uh, controlled by the mafia. How many gambling machines are there around uh, New York? Even in one neighborhood. Let's just go to 
Bensonhurst still. There's still a bunch of mobsters there. Let's say there's 100 machines. A machine can earn thousands of dollars a week. Now, we also look into the Gambino crime family. And we look into an indictment recently with this group over the last six months in June of 2024 involving Edward Lafort and multiple other members of the Gambino crime family. We would know that, and I've talked about this indictment. This is big money being talked about here. You look at this indictment involving Mr. Lafort. According to the state of New York, he had a managerial role within an illegal sports gambling operation utilizing an offshore gambling website that is not legally sanctioned. From September 2022 to March 2023, that's about a six-month period. This operation totaled about 70 bettors who wagered approximately $22,753,964 in a six-month period. That's a lot of bets. Throw in the fact you can also loan shark because if people can't pay, you give them a loan. And we're going to talk about loan sharking and the free money you get from that. It's all twofold. This is big money being talked about here. This is not, you know, a hundred, two hundred dollar bets. These are fifty, sixty, hundred thousand dollar wagers. It's a lot of money. That's one football season, September to March. That's football and basketball, and that's just one operation. Bookmaking is still very helpful to the mafia. It just is. I, I know of all sorts of rackets over the years. Anytime you see an indictment involving the American mafia. One thing you'll see, illegal gambling. It is a very simple thing to get. And nowadays, places like New York and New Jersey, Pennsylvania, they're upset because they're saying, look, it was always back room and we get it then, but it ain't back room anymore. And you're taking money out of our pockets because this is all untaxed. So a gambler that would go bet 500 at FanDuel, well, now he's betting with you and we're not getting anything out of it. Gambling's still very important to the mob, and it'll always be a backbone. It's that simple. We look at another bread and butter industry. I heard a mobster say one time, there's no better money than shark money, and that's exactly true. Loan sharking is still a very, very good business to the mafia, and we have proof of that even in 2024. The definition of loan sharking is the action or practice of lending money at unreasonably high rates of interest. It's a simple way to make money. And I'll break it down pretty simply. Let's say a loan shark, whether they're mob related or not, gives you $5,000. Generally, that's a 10-week loan. Now, what you will do is for 10 weeks, every Friday, let's say, you will be asked to pay $650 for 10 weeks. They might say to yourself, well, I only borrowed 5,000. 650 times 10 is 6,500. Yeah, you're going to pay your 5,000 back. And the loan shark is going to get $1,500 in free money. That's it. It's very simple. And let's say you have 100 people doing that. You look at it, a case involving Bonanno mobster Ronnie Gialonzo. Ronnie Gialonzo was alleged had $3 million on the street. That's how he built that nice big house, shark money. Now, what makes it illegal is generally on top of it, if someone doesn't pay, you are sending people to hurt them. There's a case recently out of New York City and Philadelphia involving yet another LaFort, two brothers, John and Joe LaFort. They're involved with a company called Par Funding. According to the government, listen to what par funding was up to. Now, both of these individuals pled guilty, uh, not John and Joe, uh, Joe and James, my apologies. The government would allege that par funding generated over 100 million in illegal proceeds. Par funding was essentially a legal loan shark business. Problem is they didn't pay the debtor. People were sent to deal with them. And this spiraled into a huge indictment involving all sorts of other things because the federal government alleges that they are both members of the mob. You also look at literally every indictment that's come out over the last five years, loan sharking. You look at the case of a person called Michael Messina. Michael Messina is a reputed member 
of the Genovese crime family, generally working out of the Bronx. It's also alleged that Michael Messina is a mob loan shark. Now, from 2011 all the way up to late 2022, Mr. Messina, who's very well off living in a uh, big home in Fairfield, Connecticut, operated out of a tanning salon in the Bronx. In just one loan, he gave a cab driver $150,000. Eventually, he started talking on wiretap. At one point, Messina would say in the spring of 2016, quote, you're with a wise guy now when referring to him as far as the loan he gave. He would also in 2018 brag to that cunt loan shark customer that he was celebrating his anniversary as a made man. Quote, it's my two year anniversary. It's two years ago. I got my thing, my stripe. Now the debtor would pay him approximately $3,070 in weekly in interest every week. And that's just one better or one loan shark customer. Messina is currently in federal prison. He's scheduled to be released late this year. Look at the Bonanno crime family. You look at John Regano, nicknamed Bazoo, who the feds allege is a longtime loan shark. In a wiretap conversation, after he also gave another debtor $150,000, his tirade to the debtor stated, quote, if I fucking slap the shit out of you, you're going to tell on me? You give me my fucking money. And we'll call it even. You fucking scumbag. I'll see you when I get out, tough guy. Don't forget, I know where you're at now. Regano doesn't give a shit. Regano wants his Regano wants his money, and he'll stop at nothing to get it. John Rosana, John Regano will always do this type of thing. When he gets out in 2027, he'll go right back to the streets and keep collecting shark money. It's easy money. And this is just one or two people. This is one or two examples of people today still doing this. This is still very much the lifeblood of the mob. You've got two levels, labor racketeering and construction, where there's a lot of people in the mob doing that. And then you have kind of the blue collar mobsters, the guys out there making money through extorting demolition companies and giving out loans, bookmaking. We've seen also one other situation. Over the last year or two, this is in New Jersey, a Genovese loan sharking ring busted up. There are women involved with this as, as, as book, make, book keepers. There are you know alleged members involved. This happens all the time. It's, it's not just a once in a while type of thing. Look, is the mob powerful? No. But in their thing, where they do things in their areas, Staten Island, Brooklyn, you know, areas of Manhattan, the Bronx, Pelham Bay, those places, they're still dug in and they still have the ability to make a lot of money through people that still worry about those types of people living in Missouri or, or Pennsylvania or places like that. You don't see this, but people still have respect for these people and they're still going to do what they have to do. People need money. People need loans. Do they have power on the global scale and the, the drug trade or something like that? No. But they adapt. Are they going into a, a store and demanding you pay them each week? No. They're just going to construction companies and unions and extorting them and then stealing everything they have. So they're adapting. We've seen mobsters jammed up for, for uh, pandemic scams. I saw of a, a situation out of Buffalo, a mob associate was selling fake test kits from that P word that happened a couple of years ago. Survive, adapt. We saw a case out of the Genovese family in New York a couple of years ago. Old mobsters in their 70s getting fake oxy uh, prescriptions. They're then getting the prescriptions, giving them to young guys and going out to Staten Island and selling them for 25 a pill. You've got to earn on any level possible. You do what you do. We saw last year six old members and associates of the mafia doing bank robberies, jewelry store robberies. That's still going on. It's definitely more muted. It's not to the level that it once was. There's no cargo hijacking going on anymore. You know, there's no strong arm extortion in mom's egg store on the corner. But they're adapting to what they can do. And they're still making a bunch of money in construction and labor racketeering and connections that they have. And through their bread and butter industries as well. Did I miss anything? 
Have you heard anything about what the mob's doing, how they're making money where you are, or what you've heard? Let me know in the comments below. And if you enjoy this video, hit that super thanks icon. Contribute to the channel. It's under the video. We'll see you next week here on The Sit Down.